Good morning. Thanks for coming out on the world's most beautiful day. Did I hear a you betcha? That was fantastic. You know what? Here's the deal. I, I've been, my head's been down, but I know that's Laura Huffman. <laughs> right? Jesus says he knows his sheep's voice. As an under-shepherd, I know my sheep's voice. Oh, my goodness. This morning, turn in your scriptures to Ephesians 6, and we are continuing in our priority passages by PJ. If you're new here, I'm PJ. Stands for Pastor Jer. And uh, the impetus behind this series has everything to do with the idea the world ends July 1st. Now, relax. Prophecy is one of my deeper gifts, but I do not have a word from the Lord on that. Um, it's the concept of what would I say? What, I am way off. I'm sorry, I told myself I wouldn't do this today. I was just going to stay to the notes. But what happened here? We've got the Huffmans and the Parkinsons on this side of the room. I am unbalanced now. <laughs> Jay and Carleen, if you move, that's it. I quit. I'm leaving. All right, let's... Let me refocus. Um, if I only had X amount of sermons that I felt were the most important things I could share with anyone, what would those be? That's what this sermon series is all about. Ten key priorities for spiritual breakthrough. And so why, why am I so concerned with spiritual breakthrough? Because brothers and sisters, we're living in a world right now that is inundated with so many ideas, so many concepts, so much discontent. If you're anything like me, you have been flooded with so many opinions that it, the aggregate of all that tends to just shut you down. And especially with the events and the happenings worldwide and within our nation and within our state and within our county, I just saw on the news last night Three shootings on Highway 4 this past week. You know what? I, I, I'm like, well, do I take, you know, Marsh Creek from now on? What do I do? And there I'll get attacked by a rogue deer. There, there's nowhere safe in this world right now. So it compels me to say, what is happening with my sheep? And I believe the Lord led me to this series because I think many of us are spiritually tired. And this is meant to help us wake up, right? To come out of those doldrums, to get reinvested and re-excited about the basics of what is holding us back from that which Christ has promised us. So today, first of all, let's go over the key passage this morning. And if you can read it, you can say it with me, Colossians 1:28. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Today's sermon is excuse entropy, sin's agenda. And I'm so excited about this because last week we were talking about Christian living, people of purpose. And so this really follows suit well, but it, 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 it's going to be heavy, kind of like last week's was heavy. And, and I'm going to do some things to keep us invested but there are some deep, deep truths for each of us to look at and say, why is it that I'm not having the kind of deep relationship with Christ that he promised? And so in looking at that idea, excuse entropy, most of the time when I deal with sin, it has everything to do with excuses. And entropy is this idea of a slow breakdown, right? Right? a wearing out. And that, that in, in the idea of science, in modern science, you know, some of you are like, I don't even need science. I already know I'm entropied, right? I'm breaking down every minute of every day. And so when it comes down to this idea of excuses, how do excuses cause us to be so much less and miss out 
on the spiritual walk, the spiritual vibrancy that God has promised us. And so, really, that's why there's two points to this today. Excuse entropy, that is sin's agenda. Remember the first encounter we have in Scripture, Genesis 3. We'll go to there in a little bit, but in Genesis 3, we see all these excuses. God gave a standard, right? Look, I'm giving you all this goodness, all this beauty, all this one, and you get to walk with me and talk with me in the garden, right? There's a reference, right, Roger? And, uh, and, and we have this beautiful relationship. Just two things, okay? Just two things. There's two things I've placed here that you can't touch. Only two. Everything else you can have. And sure enough, what, what happens? That affects all of us. And when asked, excuse, excuse, excuse. Sin has an agenda. And you're going to hear that this morning. Write this down if you're interested. Hey, you like that for a qualifier? Boy, that's an authoritative statement, isn't it? Hey, if you want to, go ahead, write it, write it, write this down. The problem with sin is not fighting against it. Do I have your attention now? The problem with sin is not fighting against it. The problem is believing sin exists so we know what we're fighting. Let me say it again. The problem with sin is not fighting against it. The problem is believing sin exists so we know what we are fighting. Even going back to the first, first sin in the garden, the serpent convinced Eve and Adam that it really wasn't sinful, that the choice he was proposing was rational. How many choices do I make in my life that seem rational? but they have nothing to do with God's standard. So we have a whole lot to uncover this morning that will hopefully speak to this whole concept and, and challenge of why we're having the difficulties with spiritual breakthrough and how sin is a block to that. There are several points I want to have you wrestle with, and then we'll, we'll get into our two main points today. The world and the church have a problem even using the word sin, don't they? What do, what do we like to say? Oh, I was in a dark place. It was just a dark time of my life. Right? I mean, think about it. This week, when, when you're going to have a conversation with somebody and they're talking about how they're having a problem that continues to exist, right? Excuses. You're going to use the word sin. I find that fascinating that I even have a hesitancy to use the word. That's what we call self-evident. That there is something nefarious going on that it makes us hesitant to even use the word. And many would have you believe, well, it's an archaic word. It's only archaic if we stop using it. The world and the church have a problem even using the word sin. There are evangelical preachers that will not use the word sin from a pulpit. Because this, this message is not popular. Right? We're, we're not, how many of you are like, oh my gosh, yes, he's speaking on sin. And you've like, you texted out to all of your friends, tune in now. <laughs> You're like nudging your, uh, you know, uh, fake that you've got a cough and let's get out of here. We don't like the idea of sin. Number two, nobody likes to believe that they're capable of doing wrong. Is that you? See, that just happened, didn't it? I just asked if it was you and you didn't want to admit it. So nobody likes to believe. That's why when we're in those moments of correction, no matter what side we're on, it's uncomfortable, isn't it? It's uncomfortable. Nobody wants to feel guilty, so we ignore and be dismissive, right? We have this great statement in our society that's come up over the past 20 years. Maybe, maybe it was popular before, I don't know, I can't remember those years. Don't judge me, right? Talk about dismissive. Don't judge me. 
All right. Some of you have been proprietors of a business, and your employee <laughs> just shows up like an hour and a half late, um, forgot to uh, send out the invoices the day before, cost you $10,000 on a, on a sales job, whatever. And so when you, when you talk to the person about that, they just throw up attitude and says, hey, don't judge me. Your, your tone is, you got a lot of tone there, right? We do not like this subject. This is one of the greatest hindrances to spiritual health and breakthrough. Help me finish this statement while I'm getting my prop. Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep, and each one has <laughs> turned to his own way, and the iniquity was laid on who? Him, being Jesus, right? So even in the Old Testament, Isaiah prophesies that it is in our nature to do what we want. We're just going to turn to our own way. Um, you know, your kids may not like being your kids. I'm sure they all love being your kids, but let's just hypothetical this one, okay? Your kids may not like being your kids, but they probably don't go as far as getting rid of the last name, right? Or emancipating themselves. Right? They're still, my kids are still cooks, whether they agree with how I look at things or, or, or whatever. But they still want to turn to their own way. And the same thing is, is natural within us spiritually. And Isaiah prophesied about it. So I have, uh, I have this guitar. I call it Moana. It's got the earth stone up there and little hurricanes coming at the earth stone and very creative thing. So, as I'm just weird that way, I name my guitars. And uh, so, somebody throw out the name of a song. Amazing Grace. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for that. <laughs> so, um, I, let's just let's just do it. Ready? How many of you were blessed by that? Raise your hand. <laughs> what? You see, here's the deal. I had those chords right. Joe, let's just check the, the master. And they look like the right chords. Thank you. But there's a problem, isn't there? But wait a minute. I spent a lot of time, a lot of hours working on these fingerings. And they're right. How come this isn't working the way... You know what? This is a handcrafted guitar of the finest woods from the Far East, from China. <laughs> this thing is master made. It's incredible. I was told it would sound incredible when I, when I played it, and I've got this left hand down. What am I doing wrong, Joe? You're the right hand. Joe, that is so judgmental. Preach. This is what we do spiritually. Oh, well, I've got this part of my life right. How come I'm not living the spiritual promises God has for me? Right? How come I'm not living the spiritual promises God has for me? Okay. Well, let's activate the whole thing, right? So we actually get what God has designed. I know what you're saying. Go ahead, say it. Wait, I was expecting that was beautiful. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Was that distractive, so distractive that there's no way you could worship by singing Amazing Grace to that? Right hand was active, Joe. As a matter of fact, it wasn't very active because I wanted you to notice something. But... Um, let me just make you hear that again, because <laughs> you can't unhear it. Amazing. 
amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That hurts, doesn't it? You know, a few weeks ago, I had you take a picture of me for an illustration. Okay, I don't know what just happened there, but that ain't going to work. Um, I think I got it. Entropy, once again. A few weeks ago... I had you take a picture of me. I had you pull out your cell phones and take a picture of me. How many of you went home thinking, well, that was narcissistic? (laughs) I did explain what that was about, but it would be easy to forget. Just like it'll be so easy to forget what I just did. Don't worry, we'll circle back around to that. The point two weeks ago with that illustration was we are more faithful to our phones than we are to God. And so I wanted you to take a ridiculous picture of me so when you're thumbing through your phone again, you remember that point and you ask yourself, have I been faithful? So for those of you that did it, here's a friendly reminder. When you see that picture, you are to ask yourself, have I acted, have I walked in faith? Or have I just been more faithful to looking at my phone? And that's a good measurement, right? It's a good measurement for me. We'll circle back around to what what I was doing there. There is a method to the madness. So turn to Ephesians 6 if you're not there yet, and we'll start to break that down and look at it and uh, see what we're looking at. The origin and personality of sin is where we're going to start today, and if you're taking notes, you're going to have to go pretty fast because I'm going to go pretty fast. Uh, The first point is, which came first, sin or Satan? How many vote? Satan. Satan came first. All right, all right. Fantastic. How many votes sin? Sin came first. Anybody? Nobody. All right, I got one person. I got one over here. One over there. I got two. I got two. I got two. Get a three, 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 three. I got three. I got three. Four, four now. Four, four now. Four. Fifteen. Was sold. Uh, how many of you are aware that Satan was a glorious angel in heaven? And what happened? To that glorious angel. He sinned. Interesting idea. I, one of the books I'm preparing to write in my life is titled, Sin is Not a Four-Letter Word. Really? I expected so much more from that. <laughs> Let me explain. What we tend to do with sin in the church is say, Sex, drugs, rock and roll, and a dirty mouth. If you can just get those under control, you're a righteous person. Anybody grow up that way? I did. Right? Four-letter words. Look, sin is so much more complicated than just whether or not you cuss. It just is. And so we really want to get in this morning and explore and look at it so that when you sit down with what God has given that is perfect, that you have everything aligned so you're able to experience that spiritual breakthrough. So just a teaser, which came first, sin or Satan? It's a setup question. Our struggle is found in Ephesians 6.10. Is this even worth talking about? Why is Pastor Jeremy making a big deal about it? Because tomorrow or even today, you may struggle with something that is nefarious, that gets you off this this relationship with Christ that interferes with your walk with him and your ability to sense the Holy Spirit. There may have already been something that happened this morning on the way here. And so if we don't uncover those things, if we don't unmask those, unearth those things, we're still subject to them and the entropy keeps happening. Got it? So Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, gives us incredible understanding Where the struggle lies. Joe, when you heard me play that chord, what was wrong? How many strings were out of tune? That's not a fair question. (laughs) Three. (laughs) Great point. 
Not correct, but great point. Remember that for later. Our struggle, Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, says the following. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of who? The devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. When your sister or your brother is sinning against you, have you ever wondered about those people who are able to forgive so easily? And you're like, I can't forgive that. Let me give you a hint as to why they're able to get there. Let me give you a hint as to why Jesus could say from the cross as he was dying an excruciating death, Father, forgive them what? They know not what they do. There's some incredible insight here. Your struggle is not against that person. It's almost like someone who is on drugs, right? And, and they're just being incredibly irrational. Now, if they're being irrational and, and doing those things that are hurtful or harmful to other people and they're not on drugs, then yeah, I'm going to hold it against you. But because you're being influenced and you're out of control because of that influence, how many of us look at that concept and we say, well, yes, there's some responsibility because you, you made yourself susceptible to that, but there is some excuse here because you're under the influence of something else, right? You, you, you understand that concept. That's exactly what he's saying, is that, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This is our struggle. So one of the first things that I can point out about sin is, number one, it even affected Satan. It caused Satan to reject all that was good. It has that kind of power. Secondly, when we see these offenses or these horrific things happen around the world, or maybe, maybe just even mild offenses, right? My struggle isn't against the person who has gone out of their way or maybe surreptitiously offended me. It's sin. It's sin working its influence in that person's life. So if I want to get rid of excuses, if I don't want that entropy in my life, I have to recognize that there is an agenda at work all around me. And that is the source of so much of the evil and the problem within our culture and society today. The names of sin, let's go through this. Um, oh, sorry, I should have broken this down. Uh, so the whole thing of which came first. Uh, Luke 10, 18 is where Jesus had sent out the disciples in, in twos, right? So upwards of 72 disciples. They come back. They've been able to uh, command that demons come out of people, and they're thrilled that they were able to do that. And this is the famous passage where Jesus says, And I saw you falling from heaven, like what? Lightning. I always picture like Thor and the Bifrost when, when this happens with, with Satan, right? It's not like, ah, right? It's like, bam, get out. That's how God feels about sin. That's how God feels about sin. And Jesus is referencing when Lucifer sin and became Satan, cast out. And so here we have the, the, now it's not so much to teach about that moment as it is, hey disciples, be careful. If Satan could fall because of pride, so can you. And you're getting dangerously close with your pride like Satan was. That's what that passage is about. But it does give us a window and in insight, right? Uh, Isaiah 14, 12 uh, also gives us some insight uh, about who the evil one is and his fall from grace, and, and you can look at that as well. Um, our struggle, uh, Ephesians 6.12, we talked about that. It's not against flesh and blood, but it's against the powers and, and, and the present darkness. Next, this idea of the names of sin. 
So James 4, 17 talks about to him who knows what is right and does not do it, to him it is what? It is sin. That word in the Greek is hamartia. And hamartia has everything to do with the illustration with the guitar. It's called missing the mark. So it's not just this sense, and we're going to get into parabasis in a moment, it's not just this thing where I'm going to shake my fist at God and say, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Now, how many of you have heard about sins of omission and commission, right? Now, both of those fit under this idea of hamartia. So that's one, and it's this idea of missing the mark. Anytime I do not fall within the parameters of God's righteous will, does that help you? Or, let me take it one step further, watch this, little hint, little spoiler alert, when I'm out of tune with God's will. It's sin. That can include making choices out of ignorance. Right? There were moments in Scripture like Peter saying, Lord, may it never be when Jesus said, I'm going up to Jerusalem to be killed. And Peter stands up heroically like some pastors currently saying, God's real people will stand up in the face of COVID. <laughs> they have the best of intentions, just like Peter. But what did Jesus say to Peter? Get thee behind me, O Cephas. Nope, that's not exactly how it came out. What did he say? Satan. Peter, you had great intentions, but you missed the mark. I was throwing to Gary. And now poor Shelly has got to reach down and try to grab this thing. Thank you. But you guys get the point, right? So, so now, <laughs> now I intentionally miss Gary. I'm not that bad, right? So I can go like that. Look at that guy. And we didn't even advance it once, Ari. Oh, I did? Oh, okay. Just once. We missed the mark again. So, folks, hamartia is this idea of just missing the mark. And sometimes you can do that because you just weren't paying attention, right? That's why Colossians 1.28 is important. That I do, that the elders here, that anybody who's teaching teaches with accuracy and presents the whole gospel. So that you don't miss the mark. So that we present you mature with all wisdom. Amen? So that's hamaria. Parabasis is a transgression against the law. Right? Let me demonstrate. Bill, whatever you do, do not stand up. See, he's not guilty of parabasis. I thought for sure he would stand up. But if, if I had said, Bill, do not stand up, and he just stood up, that's knowing what the requirement is and saying, I don't care. As a matter of fact, it's not just that I don't care. I'm going to just do exactly what you said not to do. That's parabasis, right? That kind of sin we understand. That one we can connect to. The next one is just the understanding of, of the entity of sin, the flesh. We hear about this in Scripture over and over and over, right? It's our sin nature. It is the embodiment of what sin's agenda is. It's just always at work, always causing that entropy, that separation from God. It's not necessarily a, a willfulness by ourselves, right? Is it some of us are looking at, at health problems, some of us are looking at what's happening with the world and with the climate and, and um, attitudes and, and, you know, we're going to get hit by a meteor or whatever, Right? Or they canceled last man standing. Okay, that's a sin. But the idea is this. That sin just has this general sense of destructive nature that doesn't really have that much to do with me making any choice, ignorant or cognizant. All right? So that's a third kind of sin. And usually when you see that idea, it's, it's verbalized in Scripture talking about the flesh. Or, or in Romans where Paul talks about the creation is groaning. All creation is groaning because of the effects 
of sin's agenda. Um, the last concept I want you to grab this morning is anomia. And it's a general frame of mind that it's antagonistic against God's righteousness. Have you ever met this person, or maybe you are this person, that you just don't want to have anything to do with the things that are righteous or of God? That it, it just gets underneath your skin and it bothers you and it drives you to anger. That's different than hamartia. That's different than parabasis. Okay? So hopefully what I've done here is given you a quick snapshot of the way that sin's agenda manifests itself all around us. It's not just as simple as saying, oh, I struggle with sin. Yeah, we struggle with sin, but in how many ways? And when we get to the second uh, part of the sermon here in just a minute, you're going to see how we deal with this issue of sin. That if we're not complete in how we deal with it, it affects that beautiful spiritual endeavor that is promised to us. And if it affects that, and it always sounds like that guitar sounded, doesn't that affect how you feel about the guitar? Of course it does. But what a tragedy if I threw the guitar away because I thought the guitar was no good. You know how many people have thrown away Jesus Christ because they thought he was no good? All because they didn't understand. Judas threw away Jesus Christ because he reacted emotionally to something that he felt he was entitled to. He didn't understand. That's that anomia. He was offended by Jesus' actions and his righteousness. It didn't fit with his. Does that make sense? And he didn't do homardia. He didn't do parabasis. Well, in some forms he did parabasis. In some forms he did homardia, I suppose. But really it was sin coming in this agenda that self-justification. How many of us have ever done things against God, but we thought we were doing the right thing? Right? Just like Peter. No! I'll never let you go be crucified. Isn't that crazy? That we can actually sin by trying to do the right thing, what we think is the right thing. There's only one way for us to understand how to live free or be liberated from the agenda of sin. How to stop the excuse entropy. Let's get to it this morning. So, let me talk about the origin of sin real quickly. Uh, turn to Genesis 3 if you want. Uh, you don't have to necessarily, but Genesis 3, I'm just going to speak to it. I'm not necessarily going to teach from it. But here we have this first picture of sin entering into the world. It came through whom? The serpent, right? So... We don't really know because this was kind of a, uh, um, the way this story was passed down for generations was through verbal. And so it almost has this folk story kind of nomenclature about it, right? So we don't know if the serpent was the serpent and it just did what it did or it was possessed by Satan or Satan took the form of a serpent, or, or, or whatever. That's not what the story is about. <laughs> so don't concern yourself about those things. That has no value. The reality is this, is that there is a sense to where what happens is excuses. Excuses broke down the truth. And enticement broke down the truth. So Genesis 3, we see this idea of, hey, you know, we were born this way because of original sin. And let me make the argument for this so you understand. And it, it would take me a whole month to teach on this in an adequate fashion, but I'm just going to glance on it, right? So Genesis 3, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field. And then you know the story. He comes to Eve and, and he starts to throw out questions. Verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, there's some truth in what he said. 
Because later in this chapter, God says, you know, now they understand, like us, good and evil. Sin can often mask itself in truth. And so there's excuses by the enemy, and there's deception, but what happens as a result? So God asked Eve and Adam, verse 13, what is it that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. There's one of the key components of sin, is deception. The Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this cursed art. Now listen for a second. Up until this very moment, everything was great. Everything was copacetic. Serpents were nice. They would have been our best friends. Everything changed here. Adam and Eve were taken out of a beautiful, not only were they taken out, they were forced out. They were driven out from the garden, from God's perfect will for them. From this point, from this moment on, each of us, are not experiencing what God had initially intended for us. But the good news, and an amen follows on this, is he will come restore all things and put, he's already conquered over sin and death. But at that point, when he returns and restores all things, it will be without sin. So it's coming, folks. We get to go back to the beginning. But here, life changes for all of us. Whether it's broken relationships, whether it's addictions, whether it's the world crumbling away, whether it's us being ill and struggling with health issues, whatever it is, God never had that written in his will. But sin entered into the world because we were deceived. Even Adam were deceived. And so what happens as a result? Well, Romans 6, let's go there. Turn, it, it's, it's too important for you not to see this. What am I speaking to? I'm speaking to the doctrine of original sin. So many of us may be saying, hey, you know, okay, I struggle. It's, it's kind of a non-issue because I think each of us, if we kind of look at our lives, we're, we know those four definitions of sin I gave you, we know somewhere in there we've sinned. But just to help you understand the person who wants to deny that, First John is, is a great book to go and, and deal specifically with that idea because the, the Essene community and the Gnostic community were wanting to deny any culpability in morality. They just went amoral with their society. They just eliminated sin and the consequences of sin. And John comes along and he writes a defense of, of who Jesus is and God's will and says, if you say, if you claim to have no sin, you are a liar and you walk in darkness. Okay, so go review that. But let's look at 6, verses 15 through 23, I think is what that says. 15 through 23. And this is some incredible insight from Paul, speaking about original sin. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? (coughs) By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you were once presented your once for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more loss, lawlessness so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification for when you were slaves of sin you were free in regard to righteousness in other words you you were free you, you had no connection you had no obligation to righteousness Because you were pursuing sin. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of those things is death? I really want you to hold on to what Paul said there. The fruit 
of a sinful life is what? Death. Can you see that in our society? But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is what? But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 5, we'll get into this, and it speaks about this concept, this idea that through one man, Adam, sin entered the world. And therefore, we are all, if you want to understand sin, go to the book of Romans and just dive in, and you'll get out in about three years. All right? So what Paul is saying is, because of that sin in the garden, through Adam, we were all condemned because of that sin. We all live under that experience, right? I could do something absolutely horrendous, right? I could do something absolutely horrendous. And do you think my kids get to walk away from it for free with no effects whatsoever? No, because they're cooks. They're cooks. Now, did they commit the horrendous Sin? No, but they have to deal with the consequences. That's probably the best way I can tell you how original sin works. I didn't make the choice. You didn't make the choice to listen to the serpent. But we are from Adam and Eve. And their choices have a residual effect on us. But the beauty of what Paul says is what? You no longer have to be slaves to that sin. Jesus has conquered over sin and death, and therefore you have been given eternal life. Thank you. Amen. This sin stuff is pretty heavy. Let me get into this. How to rule over sin. Right? So Genesis 4 is one of my favorite passages when it talks about sin, and it really has this, this sense that makes me want to study this in a greater level and will come out in my book. I actually think sin is an entity. Now, this is me speaking. This is not necessarily the scripture. The Lord didn't give me this word. But I think it's an entity. I can't describe how it works. But the way God describes it to Cain gives it personhood. It gives it personality. Why God doesn't just conquer over sin immediately and why he allowed it to exist so it took down Satan, made Satan and his, and his followers slaves to it on an agenda, I don't know that answer. What I do know is that Cain gets angry because he just didn't do what is right. That's what, that's what the scripture tells us. So God let, Adam, or God let Cain just sit there and stew in his own anger, right? What a beautiful picture of who God is. God came and talked to Cain. When Cain was struggling, he cared enough to come and in some kind of a personification had a conversation with Cain that went like this. Cain, why are you so bent? And he knew why. It was a rhetorical question. So he follows it up by simply saying, if you just do what is right, it'll go well for you. Right? There, I could have just preached that, and that's usually what I do on this topic, so I, I went far afield. But you should mark Genesis 4 if you really want to grab hold of the personality of sin. And here it is. Because he didn't just stop there. He comes to Cain, says that, and then he says, but be careful, Cain. Sin is lurking, is a great word for, for the Hebrew there. Sin is lurking. It has an agenda. It is here to destroy. Does that sound like an inanimate object? Sin is waiting to, dis didn't say Satan. Sin, evilness, is waiting at your doorstep, and if you're not careful, it's going to get you. And we know how the rest of the story goes, don't we? Don't you find that fascinating? I do. 
And so I like this idea that what God said to Cain is you have to rule over it. You have to rule over it. This is before Jesus and the cross, and I'm like, what? How are you gonna... God's expectation is that we rule over sin. Well, if his expectation is that, then he must have made a way. Now, we have Jesus. And Jesus, what? All we like sheep have gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid the what? Sin. The iniquity. The sin, on, not on us, but on him. That's what the cross does. Amen? Amen? Because we can't pay for that iniquity. We can't write that check. And so Jesus paid the penalty. He has conquered over sin and death. Romans. So he's done his work. We're all done now, right? Everything's great. Jesus did it all. Now we can just go live freely. I hear this word free a lot. We're done. No, we're not. Because there's this whole element that God says you need to rule over sin. We know that sin has been conquered, but we also know Paul, John, everybody else writes about it, that there's this continual choice that we have. Romans 8 speaks about it. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to defer this into next week. But do you see what I did there? Because it's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> We're going to review Romans 8, and I'm going to give you homework. I want you to get into Romans 8 this week and see what it means to rule over sin, because you and I have choices to make. But... Are we going to deal with it? Our deal is to rule over sin. Are you getting it yet? Our deal is to rule over sin. I'm not having anybody go, aha, that's brilliant, so let me point it out. Do you see the blue letters? I thought it was really good, but anyway, okay. We need to remember who we are. So much of what happens in our lives when it comes to sin's agenda and our excuse entropy is because we forgot who we are. We need to start with remembering who we are, the new man, not the old man. Secondly, we need to define what sin is. We need to be honest about what sin is. I need to figure out what's wrong with this because it is designed perfectly. The master luthier made my salvation perfect. And if it's grinding along and making weird noises, I need to do something to break through so that I'm experiencing that freedom that Jesus promised. Rather than saying, this thing is horrible, I'm throwing it out. How many, I just had a long conversation with somebody who said that their friend, a family member, threw, threw out Jesus. And all based off of people. Can I just encourage you, don't ever evaluate, don't ever evaluate Jesus based off of people. There are so many examples in Scripture where that's one of the agendas of sin or the enemy. That's the thievery. Let's try this again. You think there's anything wrong with this master-made guitar? Nope. Handmade by a master luthier <laughs> in the Far East. Now my left hand's doing everything it's supposed to do. My right hand's doing everything it's supposed to do. The woods are perfect. The strings are great. But one thing that's out of alignment is messing up everything. So, sometimes we got to tune up. Okay, these, these don't matter. That's just because the room affected it. Oh, there's a lesson. This one 
is the culprit. Prayer, confession, humility, obedience, desire for God's will, we're there. How many things were wrong with this? One. And we wonder why we're spiritually struggling. Because I know in my life, I give myself permission to have one thing out of a life. What I don't realize is it affects the entire thing. And the joy that's given to me as an opportunity, this was perfect. I'm the one that messed it up when you weren't looking. One thing out of alignment can affect it all. That's how sin works. Let's see if it brings joy to us. In closing, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that has saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I. Was blind, but now I see. Right? It unified us. Absolutely beautiful. But that's why we have to pay attention to sin's agenda. There's nothing wrong with the system. Until I mess it up. So I've got to what? I've got to remember it's perfect. I've got to stick with it. I have to define what the issue can be. I've got to, it, no excuses. Right? I've got to confess that I messed this up. Then I've got to abandon my bad attitude and my laziness. And then that gives me the opportunity to have the liberty to just soar with you without barrier, because that's sin's agenda. This morning, I want to give you an opportunity just to reflect in prayer. And I'm just going to play in the background. Um, and you can use that guide. I'm going to hit on it next week. We'll break it down for you. You can use that guide to kind of do work in your own heart. We're going to be doing communion this morning, so there's no better time to look at our lives, examine our lives, and it's this beautiful idea of coming before the Lord and understanding sin has an agenda. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. There's no need to have shame. We do not want to live in guilt because of sin, right? There is therefore now no what? Condemnation in Jesus Christ. It's not about that, but Satan would have you believe it. That this whole thing about Jesus is about guilt and shame. No, you've got the guilt and shame no matter what unless you have Jesus. And when you have Jesus, you have the opportunity to confess and to be given liberty over that. Amen? Let's spend some time in prayer. Go to prayer and confession.
Lord, we pray that we never end up with a twisted view of who you are because of sin's agenda. You tell us that if we are faithful to confess our sins, you are faithful to forgive us from all unrighteousness. So, Father, help us to eagerly work towards the freedom that is in living a spirit-filled life rather than walking in the flesh. Help us to practice these things that help us rule over sin, knowing with full confidence Jesus has already conquered sin. So it is simply about aligning ourselves and getting everything together and no excuses about having one or two little areas of our life that we give ourselves rationale or reason to be outside of your will. Thank you, Lord. Amen.